Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. It's uh, my great pleasure as the acting director of CISD to welcome you to SOAS um, this evening. It is our great pleasure, indeed, honor to have with us um, Dr. Hassan al Um And we are very pleased that you're here, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I could engage in a long uh, account of uh, Dr. Sharistani's um, career, um, but on a day when we've had a government reshuffle in this country, I think it's safe to say that you've occupied many of the portfolios that um, our current Prime Minister is busily rearranging um, in this country, um, within uh, Iraq. It is no little story, though, that beyond your career in government, that you have such an interesting tale to tell, and I'm sure we'll hear elements of that um, during the course of this evening, and indeed in terms of the question and answer, which I invite you to join me afterwards. But the main emphasis that we want to um, enjoy within your company this evening is looking at lessons from Iraq in combating terrorism. And that's an issue that affects well, many of us, not only uh, within Iraq, but within the region, and indeed within the United Kingdom also has suffered its proportionate share, shall we say, of terrorist activity. So without any further to do, um, I'd like to hand over the stage to Dr. Sharistani and allow him to tell us a little bit more. So over to you, sir. Welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> it is a great pleasure to be with you this evening at such a prestigious university to talk about terrorism and lessons we have learned in combating it in Iraq. But first, I would like to thank SOAS Center for International Studies and Diplomacy for inviting me to its annual lecture to talk on such an important <clears throat> topic that has become the most pressing issue of concern to the safety and security of our societies in the 21st century. I will discuss our struggle in Iraq against terrorists who overrun large parts of the country and committed outrageous atrocities against the people. I also find it necessary to cover the ideological background that has led so many young people in the Muslim world and among Muslim communities in the rest of the world to be attracted to such terrorist groups and our collective responsibility to combat terrorism and extremism ideologies that pose threat to our human to our humanity at large and our common human values and heritage i'll use the word daesh to refer to the entity that calls itself the islamic state in iraq and levant which is more commonly known as ISIS or ISIL, because calling it Islamic makes us unintentionally fall in the trap that the organization endeavors to divide the world into Muslims and non-Muslims entrenched against each other. For years, Daesh overrun significant, four years ago, I'm sorry, Daesh overrun significant territories in north in, uh, northeastern Syria and northwestern Iraq, totaling about 100,000 kilometers squared. They managed to recruit tens of thousands of foreign fighters from as many as 110 countries around the world and 
Daesh spokesperson, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani at the time, declared that their caliphate would, quote, remain and expand throughout the Middle East and into Europe. Over time, Daesh and its allied terrorist groups expanded to areas in Afghanistan, Libya, Nigeria, Somalia, Yemen, the Sahara region, and Southeast Asia. The organization has also sleeping cells in more than 50 countries in the world. It is a potent danger to many societies. And in the last three years alone, Daesh Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups carried out 45,000 attacks in 25 countries, killing about 117,000 people, 30% of whom were Iraqis and 16% were Afghanis. When Iraq started its campaign to free the country from Daesh two years ago, the terrorist group commanded about 15,000 foreign fighters in Iraq from many countries and almost 20,000 locals. Over the radios, terrorists were speaking Russian, French, English, Dutch, Pashto, and Arabic with non-Iraqi dialects. All Iraqi areas that were overrun by Daesh has been liberated now, including major cities of Mosul, Ramadi, Tikrit, Fallujah, Tal Afar, Hawija, and Al Qaim at the Syrian borders, with a total population of more than 6 million people. Since liberation of these areas, 2.8 million people who fled Daesh have returned to their homes. But there are still nearly 3 million people who are internally displaced. In this campaign, Iraqi army, armed forces, including the popular mobilization, Peshmerga, and tribal volunteers, managed so far to eliminate about 29,000 terrorists. Almost half of them were killed in the Mosul city. These forces have fought one of the most difficult and intense urban battles since the World War II. Protection of the civilian population was top priority for the Iraqi forces, often at great risks to themselves. And this was the reason why the battle for Mosul, for example, almost took seven months. where combating forces failed to strictly observe the engagement rules, the Iraqi government announced that it would investigate all allegations. Nevertheless, there have been incidents well, when local residents whose family members have been executed by Daesh took revenge actions against the terrorist families. This is in contrast to what was propagated to the population that they will face sectarian killings. In any case, the lesson to be learned is that local police force should be trained and ready to move in to any area immediately liberated even before humanitarian aid arrives. To Iraqis, the human cost so far has been about 34,000 civilians and 
just talking about the Battle of Daesh because the Iraqis lost more people during the insurgencies earlier. And about 11,000 combatants. Most of them were killed in mass executions of captured soldiers in the initial wave of attack and civilians who have resisted occupation of their towns or have tried to escape from Daesh controlled areas. <clears throat> Despite these great sacrifices, the threat of Daesh in Iraq should not be considered eliminated without a parallel effort in Syria. Since the remaining areas it occupies in that country borders Iraq's vast northwestern desert that is difficult to patrol. However, the situation in Syria is significantly different. There we witness a full-scale civil war that has created an opportunity for Daesh and Al-Qaeda to control large areas of that country. The campaign against Daesh and Al-Qaeda affiliated Al-Nusra Front by the Syrian Armed Forces and its affiliated militants with Russian air support on the one hand and by the Kurdish and Arab units of Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, with the support of a global coalition, on the other hand, succeeded so far to dislodge them from more than 90% of the area they occupied, including Raqqa, the capital city of their caliphate, Deir Zor, and the border town of Al Bukamal. However, although the end of Daesh in Syria is practically in hand, another terrorist organization, Al Nusra Front, with similar extremist ideology, still occupies large swaths of Idlib province and has become a gathering point for the remaining members of Daesh. The de-escalation of confrontation between the regime forces and the opposition through ceasefire or other arrangements is necessary to focus all efforts on defeating these terrorist groups in Syria. Fortunately, this goal is now prioritized by all actors in Syria and their international backers. However, the Syrian crisis would not be resolved without a political settlement between the regime and its political opponents. The longer it takes for the parties to the conflict to sit together under UN auspices in Geneva, in Sochi, or elsewhere to reach peaceful solution to their political differences, the more blood would be shed to reach the same result. It is also encouraging that all parties to the conflict in Syria agree on maintaining the territorial integrity of the country and the right of the Syrian people to determine their future by Syrian-led political settlement. Outside actors should encourage all parties to meet, discuss, and agree on a roadmap for peaceful settlement rather than arming them to prolong the civil war. <coughs> Excuse me. I do apologize about my voice and my cold. Although the final defeat of Daesh and associated groups in the region is in sight, but we should not overlook the fact that many foreign terrorist fighters would be returning home or relocated in third countries where they would pose serious threats 
to those societies. The UN Under Secretary for Counterterrorism, Vladimir Vorenkov, reported to the Security Council recently that, quote, there are at least 5,600 fighters from 33 countries who have returned home. Many returnees are very well trained and equipped to carry out attacks in their own countries. Others hope to radicalize and recruit new followers to their cause, unquote. From Europe alone, there were about 5,000 terrorists who have gone to fight in the Middle East, including around 800 from the UK. It is estimated that around 30% have returned home. Among those returning, there are about 400 who came back to the UK. Many foreign terrorists have also been captured in Iraq, plus about 1,500 wives and children of these terrorists. Those who have committed crimes in Iraq would be tried there, but their wives and children must be re repatriated to their countries that don't seem to be very keen to receive them back. Iraq also gathered valuable information about Daesh terrorists from computer data and paper registries that have been captured in the liberated areas. These include names, nationalities, and tasks assigned to each member. Based on these data and other sources, Interpol currently has 19,000 terrorists on its surveillance list. And it is extremely important that all countries cooperate with Interpol to follow up on these terrorists to minimize the dangers they pose to their own communities and countries. Now, I would like to move to another front of our battle against terrorism and caution that the military defeat by itself is not enough to eliminate the dangers these terrorists pose to humanity at large. The decisive battle against them is ideological and the responsibility primarily lies on the Muslims themselves in the Muslim world and on the Muslim communities in the rest of the world. Allow me to elaborate this point. The ideology adhered to by Daesh, Al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and all Salafi militants is extreme interpretation of Islam that was advocated by Ibn Abdul Wahhab in the Arabian desert in the mid 18th century that denounced traditional Islamic practices and considered the majority of Muslims as infidels and rejected the traditional diversity and pluralism of Islam. The spread of Wahhabism in the last four decades in some Muslim countries and among Muslim immigrant communities in the West was funded by the petrodollars to gain political influence. Much of the discrete support for these terrorist groups have surfaced now that some of those countries got entangled in political row and exposed each other's role. 
on the bright side, this is an opportunity for all to reconsider their plans to use terrorist groups to achieve political gains and realize that these groups pose as much danger to their own country as to the rest of the world. To understand the causes of jihadi terrorism and why so many young people in Muslim countries and from Muslim communities elsewhere are attracted to it, we should consider the root causes and what can be done collectively to face this challenge. There is a combination of various factors that give rise to radicalism, violence, and terrorism among the youth in particular. These include political, economic, and social grievances, and teaching extremism in the name of religion. In the Muslim countries, the responsibility mostly lies with the governments, political oppression, and fair distribution of national wealth, widespread corruption, failure to provide essential services, lack of social justice, and bad governance are all factors that fuel deep resentment among deprived masses. Some young persons among these depressed people would be attracted to extremist groups who advocate that there is no way out of their misery other than, the, other than resorting to violence. On the other hand, in countries with sizable Muslim communities, such as UK, there are other factors that are sources of grievances that if not addressed, may also lead some individuals to resort to violence. These include intolerance, discrimination, lack of social cohesion, and disrespect of cultural differences. Absence of effective platforms for these resentments to be expressed and the grievances to be addressed leads to a buildup of a feeling of injustice and such communities become fertile grounds for recruitment of terrorists. It is also a historical fact that Muslims have been victims of atrocities by others. The decades long suffering of the Palestinians and the genocide of the Rohingya are daily reminders to many young Muslims, Muslim men, that the world does not care about their suffering unless they take up arms to defend themselves. One should also not overlook the historical, ethnic, and sectarian divisions among the Muslim nations in many countries. These differences have recently been stirred up for political expediency and sectarian division have been cultivated by some actors in the Middle East to redirect attention from their own political and social problems. Having discussed the threat terrorism presents to humanity and its root causes, let us ponder what our joint responsibility to face this challenge is. The world should realize that Daesh and its comrades of all shades of Salafi militants are a real threat to all. Not just brutal terrorist groups in some part of the world. No country 
should wait until one of its cities is attacked or its citizens are murdered to comprehend the seriousness of this threat. It is not sufficient to draw or uh, to draw local or even national plans to deal with them. These terrorist groups should be fought at the global, regional, national, and local levels. Not only in Iraq and Syria, or in Libya or Afghanistan, but in all the 101 countries where new jihadis are recruited today. Muslims, Muslims themselves should be at the forefront in combating militants that terrorize the world in the name of their religion. The responsibility to drain the recruitment grounds lies primarily with the Muslims themselves. Muslim scholars are called upon to rethink, reform, and reinterpret certain classical and medieval texts about jihad. For that purpose, the scholars and Muslims in general must irrevocably condemn any act of terrorism under any banner, under any banner and for any cause. Patriotic struggle for just causes does not require terrorist acts against innocent people. Schools, mosques, and religious centers in the Muslim countries and within Muslim communities in the rest of the world that preach extremism ideologies are fertile grounds for recruitment of would-be jihadis. These should be carefully monitored and held accountable for breeding terrorists that threaten security of their society and the world at large. Freedom of belief should not be allowed to be used as a pretext for ad advocating extremism that lead to terrorism. More attention should be paid to address the causes that attract young people to such terrorist groups. Engagement of marginalized and frustrated communities by developing national policies to absorb them into the larger community and addressing the issues that agitate them is essential to deprive the terrorists from recruiting new volunteers. In Iraq, a hard lesson has been learned that without the full participation of all the ethnic and religious communities in the political system and addressing the grievances of these communities, whether these grievances are factual or perceived, is cornerstone to a national reconciliation program that allows all citizens to feel free, protected, and equal. <coughs> I do beg your pardon. Civil wars in Syria, Libya, and Yemen are attraction grounds for terrorists. Speedy resolution of these conflicts through peaceful settlement among the warring parties that allow the people of these countries to determine their future and choose the political system that serves them best is necessary, not only to protect the civilian population, but also to, de to deprive terrorist safe haven for recruitment and training. A more urgent need that the international community should pay attention to is the paramount importance of rebuilding the liberated areas when terrorists are cleared and helping the traumatized population in these areas. Such reconstruction program 
in addition to providing a basic, the basic human needs, would encourage people to return to their homes and rebuild their lives. Would also create jobs for the unemployed youth who otherwise could be attracted to such terrorist groups out of desperation. The cost of reconstruction and rehabilitation of victim communities are enormous. Only in Iraq, the material destruction inflicted by Daesh is about 47, 000, uh, 47 billion dollars, according to the Ministry of Planning Field Survey recently. Excluding the damage to the archaeological sites, that is a priceless. In Syria, the UN Special Envoy for Syria, Stefan Dimistore, has said rebuilding Syria will cost at least $250 billion. It is encouraging that a donor conference is planned to be held next month in Kuwait to coordinate international efforts to raise funds to rebuild areas liberated from Daesh and help displaced people to, to return to their homes. However, the immediate and urgent need is to, put, is to restore the basic water, power, medical, and edu educational infrastructures. The UN outlined an appeal of $1.3 billion for post-ISIS humanitarian and stabilization requirements in Iraq. This is a small cost compared to the human costs and the resources that have already been dedicated to combating terrorism. To conclude, I would like to emphasize that terrorism has become a major threat to security and order in the 21st century. And it demands a more collective response. No state on its own can deal with transnational terrorism. And without international cooperation, it is not possible for any country to protect its citizens from terrorism. Daesh has been defeated on the ground in Iraq and Syria and would, would not be able to operate from, ge uh, from a geographic basis in these countries at least. We have succeeded to dismantle its physical caliphate, but it has exported terrorism to other countries and is planning to terrorize the world. They will continue their mission in three ways. First, by trying to establish new, base, uh, new bases in countries with conflicts, such as Afghanistan, Libya, and Yemen. As many of these, uh, as many of those who have left Iraq and Syria headed to these countries. <coughs> Second, they will also use their sleeping cells to carry out attacks such as the Sinai, such as on the Sinai Mosque in November last year that killed 309 worshippers. Thirdly, they will direct lone wolves to conduct terror assaults in many of the European and American cities. These kinds of terror activities are expected to continue for some time, but at much lower human cost to the mass slaughter and genocide campaign carried out by Daesh in the areas they control. The most effective tool to defeat terrorism is to resolve military conflicts peacefully, particularly in Syria, Libya, and Yemen. 
tackle poverty in the world and work together to lift up communities that suffer from social exclusion or economic deprivation and make the world more just and endurable for all its inhabitants. We should not win the war, but lose the peace. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there was so much there. And watch <coughs> gather yourself and have a moment full of water. Um, just to say thank you once more. And we'll now have the opportunity for questions for approximately uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, if you'd be kind enough to um, pop your hand up and identify uh, your name and uh, affiliation as um, relevant, um, I'll be happy to take two or three questions to start with. Um, gentleman there with the red scarf, I'll come to you first. And I'll come down to you. Um, can you just perhaps say a few words about the work that you do as a friend to those in difficulty uh, around the world as an individual who uh, um, has learned many lessons through the job? And I think you had a lot of kids now in the Dominican Republic who have done their dream job. Gentleman down here in the red jacket will come to you as well. We'll come back. I don't think we'll have time uh, uh, this evening to go into much detail about the Palestinian uh, 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 differences and how uh, it can be resolved. Although I do have some ideas. Um, I, I, I'm not claiming that they are um, acceptable uh, to Netanyahu or to Trump perhaps. Um, but um, I don't believe any human conflict is beyond resolution. Humans uh, have been endowed with the capacity to be able to cope, deal, and find solutions to their problems. But the least that can be done if we cannot resolve the Palestinian question is to um, raise our voices in protest of gross human rights violations, attacks on, civ on civilians in the Gaza, uh, and, and make sure that the minimum standard of acceptable human li uh, 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 stand, uh, living standard is made available to them. Otherwise, when people, young Muslims throughout the world, are exposed to these nightly television uh, coverage of how the children are being attacked, how this young uh, girl, uh, uh, in Palestine has been treated in the courts and so on. You cannot help but uh, expect that uh, young people uh, are going to be attracted to terrorist groups. I'm not saying all Muslims, obviously, 
the overwhelming majority of them would, wouldn't, but uh, some young people out of desperation will feel that there is no other way in this world but to stand up and take up arms and to defend their oppressed uh, brothers and sisters. Um, this is a fact, this has been a very um, strong recruiting point uh, for Daesh and similar groups throughout the Muslim world. Question here around um, relationships to other conflicts and how you saw the uh, gestation of this in the Cold War. Yeah, you are absolutely right that um, the Mujahideen were basically created, helped, supported, trained, financed, uh, and, uh, and encouraged by uh, the West and the Gulf countries uh, in Afghanistan to fight the uh, Soviet Union at the time. And the um, experiment has been very successful. Um, they have proved very potent force that can even um, challenge um, the Soviet army in Afghanistan at the time. And um, they did not realize at that time, if I want to give them the benefit of doubt, <laughs> that um, uh, cultivating terrorism can backfire in their own societies and elsewhere. I will even go beyond that um, and say that some countries, without naming any in, 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 in public, because I could be sued by them, um, they thought that that experiment can be repeated in Syria, bringing them there, training them, uh, and uh, arming them uh, can uh, bring down regimes, changes to their like. And it was later on in the Syrian war, when it expanded into Iraq and, and Daesh and the rest of it, that they did realize that um, how dangerous that game can be to their own societies. Uh, and I think now most those who have um, supported in one way or another, none of them will say it publicly that they did support actually, but we do have a lot of um, data gathered in Iraq by capturing these people, how they were supported, where they were trained, how they were equipped, they, and, and so on. And they do realize that this was not necessarily the best thing to do um, to propagate their political um, uh, 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 agenda in these countries. I believe now almost all have come to the conclusion that um, terrorism is no way to, uh, to propagate your political agenda and we have to work all together to um, eliminate it. Now, as I try to um, uh, discuss, militarily that can be done. We have proved it in Iraq that it, it can be done even by the, by the Iraqis themselves, because despite of all this international propaganda and so on, there was a very limited role for the international coali coalition in helping the Iraqis. Not a single soldier on the ground fought along with the Iraqis to defeat Daesh. But um, militarily they can be defeated, but the ideological war is a very serious war. And those countries, particularly the Gulf countries, who have been um, propagating this kind of extremist ideologies for uh, uh, various reasons at various times, um, have come to the conclusion that uh, this has to be uh, rectified. They, they, they have to deal with it now before it is really as much danger to their own societies and countries as it was to Iraqis and Syrians. Thank you. We have a cl significant cluster around here. So you're gonna take the gentleman with the red tie and then I'm gonna move my way forward a little bit. I'll take three questions, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sharastani, for such a fascinating talk. My question relates really to um, the relationship between 
unemployment or employment and the level of terrorism in Iraq. From your time as uh, Minister of Oil, Deputy Prime Minister for Energy. In Western Anbar, in Western Iraq, there's a very large gas field, the Akas gas field. Um, I think 1.6 trillion cubic feet of gas there. And now that Daesh have been defeated in that area, in Al Qaim, hopefully that field will be redeveloped. And some of that gas, perhaps, at some point in the future, will be used for local industry and hopefully will create uh, jobs there. Now, I'm not saying, I don't want to say that um, terrorism in Iraq is related to unemployment because I, I think it's very complicated. I agree with you that it's more complicated than that. But do you think that provinces like Anbar can have more control or should have more control over their energy matters? Or do you think that um, these provinces, these governorates, should be confident that the Ministry of Oil, the Ministry of Finance can handle these matters and then transfer the revenues back to the, the provinces? Thank you. Well, thank you for, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, thank you for that Jump question. Uh, I think you have touched on a very um, um, sensitive nerve, very important issue. <coughs> yes, uh, the province of Ambar has very large gas deposits. <coughs> As a matter of fact, it has uh, uh, a very large phosphate deposits also, one of the largest in the world. And uh, without um, developing economically uh, that part of, the, of Iraq, and for that matter, any other part of Iraq, you cannot expect the young people just to sit uh, at home uh, and, and wait for the government to do something about them and uh, they have had some bad experience of the help not coming from Baghdad. <coughs> I think um, everybody in Baghdad is aware, not everybody, but people in, uh, uh, in responsibility uh, are very much aware of this. As a matter of fact, uh, I was aware of it um, since the bid rounds for the developing of the oil fields, if you remember, it seems you are uh, been following up the uh, Iraqi energy sector, and the Ambar gas field was put on the bid rounds, and uh, the international companies were called in 2010, even before any of this has really got out of the, out of the hand, to, um, to develop that uh, region. And the contract was signed, as a matter of fact, with the Koreans to develop that gas field, the Akas gas fields. However, the uh, uh, terrorist activities, the insurgencies in Ambar, even before Daesh, and then when Daesh uh, took over the province, as a matter of fact, it's taken over all the province, from the Syrian borders all the way to Fallujah, which is next door to Baghdad. Uh, uh, at the time, it was impossible to do anything there. Uh, now, I, I personally have sent a letter to the prime minister uh, uh, saying, that I think it's extremely important to develop Ambar and Mosul, these two provinces, and Salah al for that matter, uh, and to create uh, employment for the young people if we expect to stabilize these areas and, 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 and stop uh, the uh, young people to even consider joining terrorist groups. Gentleman, I think, Chef. Sure. Thank you, Doctor, for um, uh, all what you said about Iraq and defeating uh, Daesh. Uh, you touched on the uh, military conflict is finished, and it's time for the ideological conflict with Daesh. You touched on uh, Salafis and Wahhabis. While that's maybe mainly correct, but from my reading, I've been, I, I've been trying for the past four years to understand this ideology, and I read a lot about it. I'm, I'm originally from Iraq, uh, and I studied, I'm a Muslim as well, so I studied all, mostly all spectrum of, of Islam. And believe me, in all spectrum of Islam, the ideology of Daesh is there. We need a, a revolution, and this should be led by politicians like you, who is an uh, Islamist and a politician, is to push the untouchables of the, uh, Egypt, Azhar, Najaf, 
all the Islamic centers to purify this great religion from all these additions through accumulated through the history uh, and created those people. <coughs> this will not go. Believe me, you, you defeated Daesh, even if you defeat Salafis themselves, the, the still this ideology does exist between Shias, Sunnis, Azhar, all spectrum of Muslims. There must be a revolution to change this. Islam is isolated. Believe me, it is isolated in the world. It's not likable because of what's been added through the history to it. We have to really start a revolution in that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for that comment. Uh, I do agree with you completely. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I've said in my presentation that it is primarily the responsibility of the Muslim scholars to revisit some of the medieval texts and um, uh, reconsider them and reinterpret them. You are right. In all um, schools of thoughts um, since the early days, uh, there are references to uh, this kind of uh, jihadism and, and so on. It is true. However, uh, and, and it's also a historical fact at, at, at various times, the Muslims have taken um, uh, uh, acts of, 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 of uh, violence against others. This is history, you cannot deny it. Uh, but Islam as a religion in its totality, uh, uh, not only the Quran, but also the hadiths of the prophet, the, the scholars, the imams, and so on, if you take it in totality, it is a religion of peace. It's a religion of trying to uh, make this world uh, a better world for all humans. Um, again, I'm not saying that there are no certain texts. You can always point out to them and find out and so on. And um, I do agree with you completely. Now is the time for the Muslim scholars throughout the Muslim world, at Al-Azhar, Al-Najaf, and Qom, and uh, uh, elsewhere in the world, really to revisit all those texts and try to put uh, Islam in the, in, the, in the new light after this experience. Because I think they all realize, and they should realize, that Islam itself has been the biggest victim of Daesh. The human cost has been uh, huge everywhere in the world. But it was the Muslims, they were the main victims of, of it. And it was the religion itself that has been victim of this interpretation of Islam. And it is their responsibility to bring the other Islam to the world. And I cannot blame really uh, the non-Muslims if they misunderstand this, uh, uh, Islam and you said it's not likable. Uh, I, I, I can see that. And um, it is really the responsibility of the Muslims themselves to not only dissociate themselves, but to reject these ideologies, these extremist ideologies, as a possible interpretation of their religion. This should be you know, completely put to um, history and not be referred to at all, or interpreted in a, di in, in, in a different way than the way it has been used by Daesh or the Salafist militants or, or, or the Wahhabis. In, in the past. Yeah. The gentleman with the red scarf, and I'm going to come to the lady down here, and then we'll go back to that gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, I'm really impressed by your talk, sir. Maybe now. Uh, you did not mention, you see, the, uh, the concoction of the weapon of mass destruction, you see engineered by the neocons and Israeli lobby. There was no weapon of mass destruction, nothing else. And even now what is happening is that there is being created a excuse to attack Iran. There is absolutely, you don't see the division which was made by the Americans um, in Shia and Sunni, Pen Penning of and the creation of Daesh was a result of the American army itself, right? Disbanding of the 
uh, army of the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, in, uh, army of the uh, Israel in the uh, this army. Uh, so I can't believe that now they are creating an issue about the Iran and this is creating a corpus belli to attack. What do you say about that? No, I mean, I could, uh, I would agree with what you have said, but um, I personally uh, would not put all the blame for helping to create or, or supporting or encouraging Daesh or any other extremist group on the American policymakers alone or on Western um, intelligence services alone. Um, it would not be right from my point of view for the Muslims to dissociate themselves from accepting responsibility. What we have just discussed earlier, there are some medieval texts that have been taught at mosques in various countries. Um, that must be stopped. True, but um, if you have lived in Iraq under Saddam, you would have realized how deep the uh, Shias com communities who, seem, who, who happen to be more than 50% of the country were oppressed and, uh, and feeling that they could not really um, uh, trust their own family members. Um, I remember when I first, by the way, I, um, I should have acknowledged Dr. Dr. John Foreign is a British um, uh, doctor who went with me to Iraq uh, on the 7th of uh, April 2003, even two days before the fall of the regime in Baghdad on a humanitarian mission. And I thank him for coming uh, tonight. I've not seen him for years now. <coughs> and, uh, at that time, we just went to Iraq after many, many years. I spent 11 years in prison, and then I was 10 years outside uh, as, uh, in, in exile, as a refugee, and so on. So I really wanted to understand the Iraqi people and what changes have happened to the community. And I still remember, um, I'll be discussing this tomorrow with a group of your students, uh, as a matter of fact, because they wanted to learn my own personal um, experience living under Saddam, living after Saddam and what's going on. And I still remember um, during some of those visits um, when, when I found people, and John remembers, they didn't have a drinking water. The water was stinking in Basra. They, could not, it, they couldn't drink it. There was no drinking water and everything else, but yet um, people were um, accepting um, all this hardship. And he said, and I, I remember one uh, family, I told them, but why with all this um, uh, poverty that you live in? He says, at least we can sleep at night because under Saddam, any knock on my door, on my, my neighbor's door, we thought that our young men are going to go and we'll never see them again. At least now I can sleep and not be scared of any knock on the door. So under Saddam, there was a real feeling of oppression for the Shia community. This has came up after the fall. This has not been created by the Americans. Yes, the Americans can be blamed for some of the uh, faults. I'm not saying uh, they shouldn't. But this has been hidden there. Let's go to uh, Syria. Can you really blame the Syrian people, the majority of them who are Sunnis, who have not really been able to uh, uh, be free under an Alawite regime. It is not exactly. So this is, yeah. So this is a, a natural feeling. Now, if others come, like the Americans in Iraq or many other countries, the Americans in the West and the Gulf of countries in Syria, if they come and they cultivate these uh, deep-rooted feelings of the people, 
it, 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 will, it will come up. Sir, sir, we have other questions for me. Lady here for me. Good evening. Um, thank you so much for your talk. Um, my question would be uh, regarding the returned um, fighters who, let's say... Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yes. Um, I, my question would be um, uh, regarding um, what is your opinion about the returned fighters who, for example, have gone and changed their minds. You know, there are a lot of people who, uh, who we read about who come back and uh, are disappointed with the ideology at the end of the day. And uh, what is their role in terms of um, de-radicalizing those that come back, or how could you know society, not just the West, I think even in the Muslim you know countries that have contributed, unfortunately in a large part also to the to the fighters, you know what what is their role in terms of you know uh, reintegrating these people into the society in in a, in a positive matter? Did you catch that? I think, I think there's a question. I question. didn't hear it well. A question around, and forgive me if I paraphrase, um, the reintegration of returning fighters, particularly those whose attitudes are changed by their exposure to um, the experience of being within uh, Daesh or Islamic State environments. The terrorists that have gone to, that gone to the Middle East. Yeah, and then sort of effectively come back even yeah. within some Muslim states. And you said their attitudes have changed. Where has it changed? In, in, in the Middle East or after coming back? Well... Is that within within uh, their exposure to the um, Islamic State? Right. It is true that uh, many people, uh, particularly from the uh, West, have been attracted uh, uh, to um, uh, Daesh controlled areas with the understanding that there will be a kind of different life uh, under Islamic uh, guidance and, 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 and so on. And when they went there, uh, that wasn't the case. And some of them have tried to leave. Um, some of them succeeded, some of them they didn't, and they were punished very uh, severely. But um, as far as I know, I don't uh, claim to be expert on the Daesh followers and communities in Syria. I know more about the Daesh in Iraq than the Daesh in Syria. And I cannot generalize, I cannot automatically assume that what we have seen in Iraq is necessarily exactly the uh, situation in Syria. Um, that is a very, very small minority. These are individuals. Uh, most of the foreigners who have gone there are psychopaths are people who have gone there because uh, it was an area where they can kill where, uh, and, and they can attack others and so on. This is a fact. And um, I don't know how much you have uh, been following it or not, but there was this um, doctor from Australia, a physician, who brings his four years old son to Syria and teaches him how to chop heads with a doll. He gives a knife to his kid, a four years old, to teach him how to cut off <coughs> a doll's head, and so on. These are not people that have been just uh, guided or have gone there because they thought there will be some paradise on earth. These are people who are dangerous to their own communities. Um, they have not really been able to uh, 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 carry out uh, crimes uh, till they've seen it uh, practiced and authorized and acceptable in Iraq and Syria. I personally don't believe that those people will ever find peace with themselves or with their societies. They will, they will always be dangerous. I'm going to take two questions at a time. So I'm going to take the gentleman here and the gentleman there. I'm no. not saying that we should keep them in Iraq, but I'm just warning the, the rest of the world that be careful. <laughs> and then I'm going to come to the lady here and the gentleman there. Sir. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's uh, a comment and a question. Uh, you said fighting Daesh in Syria has been led by the Syrian army with the support of Russia on one hand and this 
uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces or the Kurdish Forces and International Coalition, on the other hand. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that you uh, didn't mention anything about the Free Syrian Army or the opposition groups right from uh, the beginning. I come from a town in Idlib in Syria. Yes. And uh, Daesh came to uh, a small town called Al -Adl um, Adana uh, in Idlib in 2012. So that's even before anyone knew about uh, Daesh. And it was the people, and there is a brigade called uh, Jabhat Tuwar Surya, which actually kicked them out of uh, the town. Uh, there is uh, a big report by Carnegie Center uh, talking about the oil deals between ISIS and Assad, uh, releasing uh, the detainees by Assad of uh, Salafist, uh, with people of uh, Salafist ideologies. Um, and again, it's the opposition groups who defeated ISIS in so many, so many battles in Idlib and Aleppo. Uh, so for me, like it is more along, along with the reasons that you mentioned of the rise of ISIS, it is the dictatorships like Assad uh, in in Syria and also like you know in other countries in uh, the Arab world that facilitated uh, and uh, led to the rise of uh, ISIS, uh, especially that Assad and Russia used the war against ISIS to crush the opposition in Syria, where the death toll more than ninety percent of the death toll in Syria was responsible, like you know, held by. Uh, Assad and the barrel bombs, uh, not by ISIS. Uh, that's not, of course, like justification of uh, ISIS, but just to mention the facts. Um, my question is um, about the medieval and classical text uh, of uh, religion. Uh, although I, I see like there is no religion that promotes for peace or for war, it is about the way that we interpret uh, the texts. Uh, so most of the interpretations in the uh, on Quran itself uh, were driven out of uh, interpretations of Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah, who uh, a lot argue that uh, he uh, held uh, ex extremist views. So don't you think, or do you agree that there should be revisiting of the interpretation of the Quran itself? Thank you. Just take the um, gentleman there as well, question. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sharasani. Um, I have uh, three questions, if you don't mind. Be brief, sir. Okay. First of all, how do you see the future of Iraq, where Good we question. have a constitution voted on in 2005 by the majority of the population, I think more than 76 of the population, and the role of Grand Ayatollah al-Sistani, who uh, basically can... Um, you know, make a fatwa tomorrow, and then the whole country can follow. Um, so how do you see this conflict between the one person deciding for the whole country and the constitution? Secondly, how do you see the, now the, in the last few months we have been hearing that uh, some political politicians in the country trying to change the law, the personal status law, where girls can get married at the age of nine. Uh, uh, and this is after uh, the, the controversy for this is actually where Iraq is just was about to turn the page and defeat ISIS and this evil ideology. At the same time, we see the government or people in this government are actually trying to change the law where they can get girls as, as little as nine years old to be forcibly married to, uh, you know, uh, how do you see the future for that country? And my third question is, what are, if we agree with my good friend there that the poverty and unemployment and deprivation is actually the source of terrorism, what are the plans by the Iraq government to rescue and to do something for Mosul and the, uh, the plains of Nainawa and the other areas of the Sunni where they have suffered the most uh, in the hands of the ISIS, and most of the cities, almost 90% of the cities are completely destroyed. Um, I have seen it by my own eyes, reports uh, <coughs> from people that uh, basically people are living under the bombed houses. They have no running water, they have no sewage, they have no future. The kids have no way to go to school and no medical um, support. How do you see this? And is there any plans for any like conferences to raise funds and to uh, do something for this. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, 
thank you. Uh, uh, to our friend from Syria who has brought up this question. Um, uh, I did not mean to uh, imply that um, the Syrian people or the Syrian opposition have not uh, tried to, um, uh, or have not rejected Daesh or have not tried to fight it. Uh, I was merely mentioning the fact that the main battles that were led against Daesh-controlled areas that were liberated, like Raqqa, by the SDF and the uh, coalition, uh, 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 international coalition, or uh, Deir Zor al Bukamal and other areas by the Syrian army with the uh, uh, supporting uh, militants that are there. I was referring to the major battles that liberated uh, 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 Daesh controlled areas in Syria. But um, you are right that uh, there, there has been a uh, contribution uh, at, from um, Syrian uh, uh, groups uh, in the opposition and they have resisted. Um, but um, let's again uh, uh, be, uh, be uh, uh, practical that nobody could really face up to Daesh and defeated in Syria if the Syrian people alone were left to do that job through the Syrian opposition and so on. That would not have been the case without the Syrian army, the, uh, the, the militants that have supported it, the Russian air cover, the American air cover, the, uh, the Arab and t uh, Kurdish communities. So, sorry? So um, uh, that's what I was uh, referring to. As to the three questions that were raised, or the three points that were raised, um, uh, the future of Iraq, I think the Iraqis have learned a hard lesson that um, fighting uh, among themselves, uh, allowing uh, non-Iraqis to interfere in their affairs, under different pretexts, um, dividing uh, the communities along religious, sectarian, um, ethnic lines um, does not really help any of them um, to build a free, prosperous, progressive country. Um, even among the Sunni communities in Iraq who have felt at times that um, resisting the, uh, uh, the Shia-led government in Iraq would um, help them to uh, regain what they consider to be um, uh, uh, their rights. I think with the experiment uh, or, or experience with Daesh, they have come to the realization that it was really the Iraqis from the south who have come to the rescue to free them from Daesh atrocities in their own regions. And I personally keep on hearing that from many of them. I don't have time now to go through uh, personal instances that I've heard people in Tikrit and people in Mosul and so on, how the grateful they were really for the liberation from Daesh after the atrocities and the suffering that they have seen. I think the Iraqis, more than any time that I know of in the recent history, are ready to accept each other, to respect each other, to live together in a free country. And uh, my uh, expectation is that uh, Iraq will move forward after um, the um, uh, experiences of uh, uh, even before Daesh with uh, uh, other terrorist activities to build a new Iraq that, as I said, a, a free, prosperous, and progressive uh, society and country. Uh, and for that, of course, you need to rebuild the uh, destroyed areas. And Mosul is as much destroyed as any other area. I disagree with you that 90% of Mosul has been destroyed. I've been there too. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, western part of the uh, city, which is almost half of it, is a flourishing now with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, markets and, 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 and uh, uh, playing grounds for kids and so on. 
the, uh, the, the eastern side, I'm sorry. The western side, uh, the old Mosul, uh, has been totally destroyed. Uh, that's where Daesh has fought its last battle. Uh, and uh, that's where they lost most of their men, by the way. And that part of Mosul needs a large reconstruction program. The Ministry of Planning in Iraq surveyed all the damages in that part of Mosul and in Anbar and in Salah al-Din. And they came out with an estimate of $47 billion that is required. Iraq obviously doesn't have in its uh, budget forecast for 2018 because of the oil prices uh, uh, in the world market, uh, doesn't have the necessary funds to, um, uh, to do that in one or two or even three years. That's why Iraq is calling for international help. And I think it's whoever can in any way um, influence um, their own governments and so on to really participate in reconstructing these areas um, is, uh, the more we could do together really to make sure that these areas are uh, uh, people to go to, back to their normal lives and their young people are busy reconstructing their homes, going to universities, uh, uh, looking for employment rather than be attracted to these ideologies. As for Sistani as one man imposing his will on the Iraqi people, I don't think that's really the case. Uh, uh, Sistani has been called uh, on, not only by the Iraqis, but also by non-Iraqis, to um, play a role to calm the situation and get the communities to live together. And he refrains from playing that role. So it's not him really trying, you know, uh, seeking a role for himself. On the contrary, um, his role has been extremely positive in the past. And uh, now, uh, I know this for a fact, the Sunnis in Iraq are more grateful to Sistanis than the other communities for the stand that he has taken in, in, you know, in, in, in their support. As to the, uh, uh, some members of the parliament who try to change the civil uh, law to allow marriage uh, uh, of, of young girls and so on. These are a few individuals who have just made some um, uh, statements in the parliament. Nobody took it seriously at all. And uh, it's, it's a good point because uh, it's supposed to be um, a, a religious issue, right? And you said that Sistani is the most influential person. Sistani is the person who has never mentioned this or, or, or accepted it or called for it. So uh, you should not really take that. Sorry? I cannot hear. I'm sorry? He's suggesting that uh, Sistani allows the marriage of nine-year-old women in his book. Who is marriage? S uh, the marriage of girls. Sistani claims that. Who is? I, I'm saying some individuals in the parliament have raised the issue but who have really accepted it? Who has even uh, discussed it in the parliament? It has not even been discussed. Okay, let, let, let's move on, shall we? So we've got, time is running short, and we have a, a reception to get to. So I'm gonna take the lady here who's waited very patiently, and the gentleman there. Then I'm coming to the two gentlemen at the back. Uh, good evening. Because we are talking about um, terrorist group and Daesh and uh, Iraq announced the uh, victory in the last few months. And I think um, we are here, at least we can appreciate the people who made this victory in Iraq. Everybody here, and I'm so appreciate, like I see a lot of um, people who came and uh, attend and have interest in this subject. I would like to tell them, in Iraq, we paid like very high price for this victory. It wasn't easy. And the, this price, it's most of it paid by the young volunteer, young men who are volunteer to fight Daesh who called Al-Hajj al-Shaabi or uh, mobilizing forces. My question to you, doctor, we hear now it's most of the Western group and human rights later and a lot of 
government and media, Western media, they try to abuse the Hashid uh, Shaabi exactly and call them till now, call them the sectarian um, uh, abuser and uh, they are militias and uh, most of them, they are Shia militias going to kill uh, Sunnis, which is that it's absolutely um, not true. Uh, really, the most of the mo uh, popular mobilization forces um, <coughs> started from the young people from the West, uh, from the South and Middle um, cities in Iraq, and most of them are Shia, but they joined by Sunni, uh, Turkmen, Shabak, even Kurds, later Yazidi, to fight Daesh. And we paid thousands and thousands of the, this young men who sacrificed their lives to save our country and save our people. What do you think? Why the Western Europe tried to like use the two faces of justice? Why dealing with these people and call them uh, sometimes terrorists for the leaders of the Hashid Shabi call them terrorists or call them militias, sectarian militias. Thank they you. not appreciate that one. And what no, the no, government we may. Iraqi We've got other questions to get to. Yeah, yeah, Very sorry, good but point. what the Iraqi government going to do against to stop this um, harassment? Really, we are really so sad about it. I'm Iraqi. I lived under Saddam and I lived after Saddam, and I know what's going on in my country. Thank you. Thank you. So you may take that question as well, and then we'll have you on quickly. Um, I, I just wonder what lessons can Afghans and Americans learn from your war on Daesh and terror in Iraq? Uh, on their war on terror in Afghanistan, you said that you fought the toughest war since the Second World War against Daesh and terror in Iraq, and, 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 that, and that's been quite tough, th despite uh, Daesh having some sort of local support in Sunni areas but you've been able to defeat them. But whereas in Afghanistan, Daesh has no local support at all, and they only uh, control pockets in some areas in the country, and the Americans dropped the mother of all bombs, uh, and that's the biggest bomb since the Second World War, but they haven't been able to defeat the Daesh. What will be your advice to the Afghans and Americans? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, uh, I do sympathize with your frustration, and I hear that in Iraq all the time. Uh, after all these sacrifices and hundreds, uh, sorry, uh, tens of thousands of lives that have been lost, and uh, although it may take a few minutes, but let me tell you this story. I'd like the audience to hear it. Uh, I've been frequent visitor to the battle lines against Daesh, and um, and, and taking some supplies and. Uh, for the young men who were fighting there. I was too old to join them. And at one point, right at the front line, there was this uh, young guy from Hajj al-Shabi, a leader, um, just north of, uh, of, of, of Beji, preparing for the Battle of Mosul. And he had a large number of volunteers of the Sunni young men from the Mosul area come and join his group as they were preparing to advance. And um, when they saw this uh, leader of the Hajj al-Shabi in the area was um, respecting me, they came to me and said, Doctor, we have a problem here, and uh, uh, maybe you can help to solve it. Um, this Ali, the name of the guy who was from Karbala, from my own town, that's how he knew me, he says, this Ali has a very bad habit. When he advances in a battle, he doesn't allow anybody to be ahead of him. Nobody's allowed you know, to be in the front line before him. He has to be the first when he attacks. And we are advancing now to my own tribe in Shirgaf, just south of Mosul. And I am the head of the tribe. I've come to volunteer here to free my people. And if we go to my tribe and my people see me walking behind Ali, try to liberate them, I can never join the tribe again. Please explain to him to allow me to be at the front line. He cannot advance to my area and be in the front of me. This doesn't work. This is how the Hajj al-Shaabi were actually cooperating with the people in Mosul to trying to reach those people and liberate them. Now, these stories are not told. 
we do hear in the Western media and from Trump's administration all the time, accusations against them and their leaders and so on. Um, uh, I can, I can hear, hear them as, uh, as much as you can hear them, but the Iraqi people do not just hear them. They really get angry, very uh, much angry uh, about this. But um, let's uh, face it. It is the Iraqis who have to build their own countries. What the um, foreign media and foreign statements uh, talk about is not going to be that um, influential in deciding the fate of the Iraq if the Iraqis decide to live together in peace, in harmony, in respect, and build their country. I don't think that these accusations will have any um, ears to listen to them in Iraq. People have seen it themselves. Uh, sorry, the second question was uh, lessons what the U.S. have learned. Well, I cannot uh, speak for the U.S. We have to ask them that question. But what I can say with um, personal conviction, I don't think Trump administration have learned anything, not only, not only in the battle against Daesh, but on, on many other fronts for that matter. And um, yes, I, I do see your point that uh, Daesh has no local support in Afghanistan. Um, and it should have been much easier to help the Afghani people, not necessarily just the government, the Afghani people really to resist and not allow Daesh to uh, grow roots uh, in that society. Uh, Unfortunately, that is not happening, or at least to my knowledge, I'm not experts on Afghanistan. I've never been to that country. I really don't know the situation, but um, I follow uh, what terrorists do in various parts of the world. And uh, definitely the tactic uh, that needs to be used in Afghanistan is different from what we used in Iraq. But one thing I know for sure, and this is what we have learned in Iraq. Other than the Afghan people in Afghanistan, nobody is going to liberate them. Nobody is going to kick Daesh out of their country, and they should not depend on help from anybody else. That's our experience in Iraq. Gentleman at the back. Yeah, so when, when I look at uh, the current insurgency in Iraq, I believe I uh, trace it back to the Operation Iraqi Freedom, its origins there. Uh, I believe the military campaign there was very successful, including the shock and awe campaign. But what happened after that was the counterinsurgency and the nation building phase went horribly wrong. My question to you is, if you were Bush or Dick Cheney for that matter, uh, how differently would you have carried out the, operation, uh, the nation building phase of that operation? Thank you. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that... Um, uh, that invasion of Iraq uh, had played uh, a big role in the mess that was created in Iraq. Again, um, I, I recall on, uh, on, on, on CBS program, uh, it's called 60 Minutes. I don't know if uh, people see it in this country or not. I was interviewed before the invasion of Iraq. What was my position at that time? And I was not for the invasion. I was on record. I'm not, I was against the invasion of Iraq by the US Army. And I, uh, and I told them, my biggest fear is the Americans are going to go in Iraq without doing their homework as usual. And they will you know, face a new situation. They will go to a society they don't understand, they don't know. And believe it or not, um, as soon as they entered Iraq, and I, I was there on a humanitarian mission, and I was approached by a very senior American there and he was asking me, who are these Merja's in Najaf? Who is Sistani? He has come to Iraq, he has invaded Iraq, and, and then he found out there's a Sistani guy in Najaf who can be influential. And, and, and all of a sudden he's asking who is the Sistani uh, in Iraq. So um, without uh, really understanding the Iraqi society, they have invaded Iraq for other reasons. Uh, you can ask this, uh, uh, Dick Cheney about them. But, um, and they have contributed definitely to the mess that the Iraqis found them. But to blame all, all of that 
on American invasion is again falling uh, uh, to the game that the Ba'athists, the, uh, the, the um, uh, Salafi jihadists have played in the country. Uh, we cannot ignore that part of it either. Neither can we ignore the serious mistakes that were committed by the Iraqi administration after the fall of the regime. So there are a number of factors that have really um, contributed to that. But on the, good, uh, on the bright side of it, I think um, Iraqis have learned very expensively, they have paid very uh, dearly for it, but they have learned that uh, they have to leave that all behind. What has happened has happened with Daesh now out of the country, they can build their own country by themselves and they cannot do that unless they accept each other as they are. Sunnis have to remain Sunnis, Shias have to remain Shias, Kurds have to remain Kurds, uh, Christians have to be Christians and those communities have to work uh, and live together and I think this is a lesson that has been learned by the Iraqi people. Thank you so much, Professor Shahistani. It's Thank been an absolute pleasure. pleasure.